Andrew Huberman went deep on psilocybin. Today, we're going to break down what he talked about, how psilocybin works, how effective it actually is with real data, and how that compares to current treatment options for depression. Also, Mr. Beast cured a thousand people of their deafness, and for some reason, he got a lot of flack for it. We're going to talk about exactly what happened, what he did to treat their deafness, and then what he can do in the future to avoid this sort of blowback. Finally, Elon Musk wants to put a microchip in your brain. I'm going to tell you why this is a good idea and why it's exciting for the future. All of that today on The Prescription Press, the podcast where we break down trending medical topics so we can live longer and healthier lives. I'm your host, Nolan Fisher. I'm a physician who believes that a healthy lifestyle is the best kind of medicine. Let's get into the episode. All right, we got Sam Sticks back on the show today. What's going on? Good to see you again. Hey, good to see you too, man. <laughs> We're going to get straight into it. Uh, I'm like uh, the Amazon driver, man. I got the goods today. And it's starting with Andrew Huberman talking about psilocybin. So he did a podcast the other day uh, where he talked about how psilocybin can rewire our brain, its therapeutic benefits, and its risks. Uh, pretty in-depth deep dive into magic mushrooms, I have to say. So he basically gets right off the bat, starts talking about how they work and how there's the magic mushrooms. Those are the psilocybin. And then there is psilocybin synthesized in a lab now, which I didn't know. I thought in these studies that they were just using natural psilocybin. Mm -hmm. But basically, psilocybin is converted into psilocin in the body. And this chemical psilocin works on the serotonin 2A receptors. And what's interesting about these serotonin 2A receptors is they are really, really present in the eyes. The prefrontal cortex, which is how we act, deals with our mood and stuff like that, connects to areas in our body or areas in our brainstem that really control like anger and motivation, stuff like that. And then our parietal cortex, which kind of deals with the same sort of issues, but also has some motor components. And then the somatosensory cortex, just a fancy way to talk about how we feel things. So that can be related to pain. So then uh, one really cool thing they did was they did some animal studies and he went over those as well. So this psilocybin in the animal studies didn't produce new neurons in the brain, but it altered the neurons that the animals had. And so there's been a lot of talk about, like, can we form new neurons in our brain with different medications or different drugs or psilocybin or whatever? It doesn't appear that psilocybin forms new neurons, but rather it makes those current ne uh, neurons change. And then it causes new connections to form in the brain. And the way they know that is by this uh, effect that seems to show up in almost everybody. And that's synesthesia. Have you ever heard of synesthesia? I'm not. Okay, so synesthesia is wild. It's basically yeah. experiencing one sense as another sense, like a different sense. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like if you see something, you can feel it. And that's mm -hmm. why, like back in the day when there was like the LSD craze in the 70s, they would say that hippies would look into the sun and they would stare into the sun. They'd go blind because they're taking LSD. When yeah. realistically, yeah. they think that was because it made them feel good. And they were experiencing hmm. that synesthesia. Yeah. So interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. But they, they do these journeys. So they've turned it into like a, a medical treatment and they've started doing studies on this and they call it a, uh, instead of a treatment, they call it a journey. Okay. <laughs> it's, too, yeah, it's a fancy way of putting it. Right. Uh -huh. um, so they're typically several hour treatments and they're done with the eyes covered up. And that's because those serotonin 2A receptors are so present in the eyes that they don't want that to distract from the effect that it has on the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. that area that regulates mood, and then the parietal cortex, which also has some uh, mood and behavioral stuff to it as well. And so mm -hmm. it goes for several hours, and they have music playing during these journeys that they're on. And yeah. the music varies as the intensity of the drug varies. So it starts out kind of soft and slow. And then as it really starts to kick in, they tend to increase the intensity of the music. 
So uh, yeah, I was like, I yeah. was like, that's that's pretty interesting because they don't want the eyes to experience it, but the music for some reason causes them to uh, experience, you know, some sort of feeling that they want to promote. And he didn't get he he kind of talked about the science behind that, but there was no there wasn't a lot of concrete evidence to it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but he did cite some articles that talked about the clinical effect of psilocybin on depression, and I thought that was the most interesting part because these are actual clinical studies that show what the effect actually is on people outside of just the general like hallucinations, right? Yeah. So there's two of them. The first one was from the New England Journal of Medicine, and it took people that had moderate to severe treatment-resistant depression. So most of these people had tried two or more medications and hadn't been able to adequately treat their depression. And they have this score that's the M-A-D-R-S score. I think it's like Mater's score. Mm-hmm. It's out of 60, zero being no depression and 60 being like the worst you could possibly do. Um, and their average score at the start was 32 and it went to 18 at two days. Okay. So that is like right on the edge of severe depression on average. And then, uh, 18 is kind of the bottom edge of moderate depression. And then over about 12 weeks, it went back up to 22. So it kind of went from on average, low, severe to high moderate to high uh, low moderate depression. And that was people that had treatment resistant depression. So obviously the treatment doesn't typically work as well on them. And that was the same with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. And then the second article was in JAMA, the journal of the American medical association, 24 people were treated in this study. They had at least moderate depression and there was this uh, this scale called the grid hammed scale, and they had not been on antidepressants. So they were given two sessions of psilocybin and 11 hours of supportive psychotherapy. And 50, 54% or 13 out of the 24 were considered in remission at four weeks. So that seems pretty promising, but mm-hmm. and it also seems to me like it was better than the previous study which kind of makes sense because those people already had treatment resistant uh, depression. And then, so some final things that he made sure to kind of touch on over and over again was the fact that people who have a history of psychosis, hallucinations, or schizophrenia, including a family history of these things should not take it. And they've all been excluded from these trials. And then uh, the other thing is that there's a, a pretty significant amount that experience like anxiety or headache and nausea during the, mm-hmm. the, uh, journeys that they go on. Yeah. Um, almost everybody has increased heart rate and blood pressure when it first starts happening, which I feel like is totally a reasonable response. Yeah. And then finally one really cool, um, table I saw was that the addiction potential and the overdose potential of this are extremely low. Yes, I saw the yeah. same thing. I, I kind of yeah. did some additional reading. I was I was fascinated by that. I saw that, um, you know, I always thought that it was a drug that you could like burn a hole in your brain if you took too much of it, right? Like you always hear these stories mm-hmm. about people who take acid and things like that. You think of like hallucinogens, you think of that category of drug, you think of like severe damage being done. So I thought it was really fascinating that there wasn't like a clinical decided like lethal dose, if you will. I didn't, yeah. I didn't that surprised me to be honest with you, yeah. Yeah. So the table I saw, I, it was actually a chart I saw Okay. on one, one axis, it had the addiction potential. Okay. The other axis, it had the lethal dose. Yeah. And so, uh, in the top right was like the worst drug you could be is most addictive mm-hmm. and, uh, most likely to like get a lethal dose. Yep. And you, you know what that drug was? I'm going to get alcohol. It was heroin. Ah, okay. Okay. All yeah. Right. And, and, and so if you think about below that, Alcohol was just mm-hmm. below that, which mm-hmm. was it was because um, it wasn't quite as addictive mm-hmm. as heroin, but it, it had a relatively low lethal dose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and morphine was right up there by heroin. Jeez, crazy. Yeah, and then so cocaine was up there too mm-hmm. with like the lethal dose. But actually, um, marijuana was more addictive hmm. than psilocybin. Really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and they both had like very like they both both had impossibly low overdose potential. Yes, 
yeah, yeah. I guess one thing I want to make clear too, just to say that there's not like a lethal dose doesn't mean that it's like like foolproof, like, oh, this is like a completely harmless drug. Like there's yeah. you know, you could have a bad trip and walk out into the road and get hit by a car. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like there's there's plenty of risks that come with this. Or you jump off your balcony, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think one thing that was important that Dr. Huberman kind of pointed out is like, hey, there's a variety of factors that are gonna basically have an impact on your experience here. Like this isn't as simple as just like going out with your best friend over to his house who's done mat like mushrooms before yeah. and just essentially saying like like going into his house and being like all right hey that you take this much essentially uh -huh. right no i was just going to say like things like dosage level and number of doses are obviously like a, a potential they could have a fact they could have a, an impact on your experience but also like you mentioned with eyes closed eyes open music being played presence of like a sober guide those sort of things are all going to have an impact on your experience so you know, you could be in a situation where you do this in an improper setting and cause, you know, some severe harm to yourself potentially. So just yeah. want to throw it out there first. So yeah, that, that, that is what he yeah. said. You know, I yeah. had that, I had that written down as well. It's like the most important mm -hmm. thing is like, if you're going to do this, don't have those risk factors of schizophrenia. Yeah. You don't want to have that psychotic break, but also you need to do this in a safe environment where there's at least a one-to-one -one ratio of people doing the treatment to those being treated because yeah. uh the stories are like i said earlier people look in the sun but you're right people mm -hmm. freaking out running out in traffic jumping off balconies yeah so obviously that would be the opposite of the treatment effect you want and i think that's <laughs> i think that's why these medications uh medications i guess that's why this chemical has been yeah. so banned for mm -hmm. so long even though it's been around for you know what tens of thousands of years or whatever people yeah. have been using it for for sure. Yeah. So I did some more research then because I was like, well, how does this compare to other depression treatments? Mm -hmm. So the the most common medical treatment for depression are SSRIs. And these are drugs like Prozac, for example. Mm -hmm. um, SSRIs are similar to placebo in treating mild to moderate depression. Um, but significant depression, they do seem to have at least a decent effect on that's not to say that they actually uh that's not to say that they actually fully treat severe depression but they seem to have more of an effect on more severe depression but the problem is, is they have a lot of side effects to them mm -hmm. and then finally exercise and cognitive behavioral therapy which is a specific type of uh basically talk therapy um, are the main treatments for all types of depression and their first line for mild to moderate depression so I, so with that being said, where does this fit in? Right. Yeah. And so yeah. for me, I think the people that have the extreme treatment resistant depression that are, you know, are digging at the, are trying to find that last treatment option yeah. and explore all options. I, I think this is where that fits in, but do you think that people are going to be willing to try this? Yeah, I mean, somebody like myself, who's a severe hypochondriac, I don't think that I would ever, <laughs> I would ever imagine doing this myself, because I'd be the person that runs out in traffic, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's interesting, though, because I think some of the stigma around psilocybin is starting to kind of, I guess, taper off a little bit. I, it feels mm -hmm. like this is becoming more of like a mainstream accepted thing now. I know like in Oregon, for example, and in Oakland, I believe as well, it's mm -hmm. decriminalized now. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how long it takes for something to get decriminalized to becoming an actually like approved, you know, FDA approved treatment for depression. I think we're probably a ways off from that. Yeah. Um, if we do see it approved, it probably won't be in the form of you just going to your pharmacy and mm -hmm. going through the Walgreens drive through and getting, you know, a bottle of mushrooms, essentially. I yeah. think that this will <laughs> probably be an experience like you mentioned where there's like a, an actual guide who is probably a physician who's going to be sober i would hope mm -hmm. and is going to put you through the experience basically in a controlled <laughs> setting so the prescription would probably be released to a physician to then administer to you if we ever see this become a, a mainstream yeah you know i think like for example i've heard of like ketamine treatments are you familiar with those at all yeah for so people, we people actually me for depression yeah, we actually use ketamine treatments. Do you really? And, yeah, and and so ketamine treatments, because they're an available medication, have been something that's been really popular uh, recently. Mm -hmm. But they aren't covered by insurance because mm -hmm. they don't have the uh, the necessary proven benefit, mm -hmm. right, to be covered by insurance. And ketamine 
is not just used as a treatment for like depression and chronic pain, stuff like that. It's used as a, as an anesthetic. Hmm. And so they found that in lower doses, it can cause not only hallucinations, but it can also cause some pain relief and some help hmm. with depression and anxiety and stuff like that. But the, the studies really aren't there yet. And so, um, one of the things that we've been doing is, is gathering data on people with chronic pain and anxiety and depression, see if ketamine treatments at low levels can, can help. Mm -hmm. And so they do like daily infusions for a week. Um, yeah. but, uh, but right now the way a lot of people are doing it is just as cash only just to try to make a lot of money basically. Mm -hmm. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I also think it's funny how you talk about the stigma, right? Mm -hmm. So it used to be like, this was uh, a drug of abuse and it got, and it got banned. And now it almost seems like it's perceived as all natural and healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Shout out to the Dodgers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny to think how that is. Um, yeah. But no doubt. But it, I just go back to like, who is this for? And the truth is it's not for people with mild to moderate depression. Uh, it's for these people with severe treatment resistant depression. And it may be another tool that we have that's available, but at the end of the day, therapy and exercise and healthy lifestyle is still the best treatment in my mind for depression. Yeah. 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 I totally see that. Yeah. No, I, I, I'll be honest. Like even the fact that this is being considered as like a viable treatment still just kind of blows my mind. I mean, I'm, I'm happy it is to be honest. Like, I'm, I, mm -hmm. It's great that people are, are seeing positive benefits from this, but you know, I thought one thing that was really fascinating was Dr. Hu Dr. Huberman mentioned that basically the effects of psilocybin can have a, like a lasting effect just beyond the treatment itself, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing it does is help people who have those certain patterns of thinking kind of get out of their own head, right? So if you're depressed, you're going to have a kind of a set way that you look at the world, right? Yeah. Um, however, a substance like psilocybin kind of help break these negative cycles. Like if you ha if you have a, a thought process of like, oh, every time I do activity A, he basically says, like, let's say you want to apply for a job. You're like, oh, every time I apply for a job, I get denied and then it makes me more depressed. So what's the point of applying for a job? Yeah. Basically beyond the experience of actually doing the psilocybin in a controlled setting, it can kind of open your mind to new possibilities if yeah. you're stuck. So I thought that was probably one of the coolest things that he mentioned in the video as well. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I think it, he described it as like having a wedge underneath a rock and it just allows mm -hmm. that rock to roll. If you get that wedge underneath there, mm -hmm. uh, it goes along with the fact that like it changes the way our neurons uh, not only function, the connections they make, but he talked about like how the dendrites on the neurons, which are just a part of them actually change, which makes you think that that that's what's having that effect. Of mm. course, we can't tell that because we can't yeah. do live people with it, but uh, it would be really cool to have a medication like this available that's effective that only has to be taken every now and then. Yeah. Right. No, Instead of sure. having to take antidepressants every single day to have something like this, that maybe if people did it, uh, maybe if they did it like weekly for a month and it had a great result. So I'm sure mm -hmm. they're going to look at all these different ways to do it because yeah. that one study, they did two episodes. Mm -hmm. The other one, they just did one. So mm -hmm. who knows? It may just be that they need repeat doses because like you don't just go to a therapy therapist and go yeah. one time. So yeah. I think that would, that would be like, you don't just, if you have a really bad infection, you don't just take one dose of antibiotics either. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be yeah. interesting. It's, it'll be interesting to see where this gets approved first. And then you're going to see a, a variety of people flying from all over the world, probably to, to get this yeah. done. So problem with medications is they tend to lose their efficacy when they get in bigger studies because there's not as much control. Usually in smaller studies, they have the same therapists that are doing the same techniques. Mm. So What's going to be really, there's going to be a couple aspects to this that are going to be important. It's the dose, how many times you have to do it. And it seems mm -hmm. like a higher dose around that 25 milligrams range is like the most effective. And then the amount of times it seems like multiple times cause better response. So it may be that by having a therapist who's trained in doing psilocybin specific treatment, that, that, that will honestly probably be a like therapist specialty is mm -hmm. like a psilocybin depression treatment therapist yeah totally it probably it maybe it already is i don't know <laughs> I, I know i was just thinking the same thing yeah. like somebody already is is definitely thinking about this there's no question yeah yeah yeah
No, one other thing I wanted to mention too, I know you mentioned depression, but I also know he mentioned alcoholism and mm-hmm. eating disorders and just addiction in general, like substance addiction as well are kind of some things mm-hmm. that this is kind of being tried around as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, that I think, uh, one of the like big stories I've heard about psilocybin was from like a small study on people that had alcoholism and they took psilocybin and like 80% of them didn't drink for however long the period was afterwards. It was, it was a significant number. So you do wonder about breaking those cycles, like with alcohol, it's just a, it's just a cycle. If you can just break that, if that, and then also they all said that is such a profound experience. Mm -hmm. So that probably has something to do with it too, is it gives you a sense of meaning, which most people, when they go to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, they're, they're working on, finding like that meaning in their life to quit drinking. Mm -hmm. And that that's always a big part of it. No, totally, man. It's fascinating stuff for sure. What do you think about Mr. Beast? (laughs) (laughs) He's a popular guy. I know that much. Yeah. Well, did you see his last video where he uh, cured a thousand people? of deafness i did i saw a lot of people really pissed off about it too <laughs> yeah people were upset i mean i thought i thought this guy's just like doing doing nice things yeah. but yeah. The, the background on it is that he found a thousand people who couldn't hear they're having difficulty hearing and they also couldn't afford hearing aids and so he got them hearing aids uh he then gave him ten thousand dollars randomly afterwards mm-hmm. and so when i was watching i was like okay you know i'm not an expert at hearing i'm not an audiologist here but i want I, I noticed that he was giving them what seemed like were pretty standard hearing aids and i'm sure they have the fancy technology built into them mm-hmm. but i i looked into what types of hearing aids are used for different types of hearing loss okay so there's two there's two main types of hearing loss there's conductive and then there is sensory neural. And then you can also have a mix of the two. So conductive hearing loss is whenever there's something blocking your ear, right? So the opening in your ear, so the sound waves are not going into your uh, ear canal or going to hit your eardrum, which then translates those sound waves uh, into a frequency in a fluid that moves hair cells. And that's what causes you to hear, right? It's It's eventually translated into an electrical signal that goes to your brain. Whereas sensorineural hearing loss is whenever those little hair cells are affected or somewhere in the nervous system is affected. And so the hearing aids that he was giving were mainly amplifiers. And so they took people that had sensory neural hearing loss And a lot of the kids have some sort of genetic condition. And then a lot of the older people have lost it as they aged. Um, And it basically amplifies the sound. So it takes whatever hearing ability they have left, which is usually very little, and just like amplifies the sound reaching there and makes them able to hear. And then um, the... There's also cochlear implants, which I don't think any of these people had, but those are like the hearing devices that you see that are on the side of people's head. Mm -hmm. And the way those work is they actually go into the cochlea. And so they're like a, almost a more powerful version of a typical hearing aid. Mm. And then finally, there's these bone anchored implants, which uh, allow sound to be conducted to the inner part of that ear, even if the outside is blocked. And from what I understand, those are typically used for one-sided hearing loss that's the the primary use for them yeah for whatever reason that happens um yeah but you're right he did receive a lot of trouble for the video yeah yeah man it's crazy i think that uh i can understand maybe why people were upset but i think having it directed at him is kind of interesting right yeah. i think that uh people were basically arguing that it exposes kind of deficiencies within the healthcare system like we mentioned on the last episode about how hearing aids are not 100% covered by insurance. Some plans do cover them partly, but it's usually a supplemental yeah. piece that you have to purchase, right? Just like dental insurance, mm-hmm. for example. It's very yeah. expensive, and the benefit is usually minimal at best, I would say. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I can see why people are upset about that. But, I mean, at the end of the day, he helped out a 1,000 people pretty significantly. I know last week we also th- talked about how hearing loss is kind of associated with um, maybe an increased risk for people who are predisposed to dementia, an increased mm-hmm. risk from actually developing dementia as well. Um, 
I mean, we, t we talked about it last week. I think there's a variety of reasons why that could be. But from the short video, I mean, you can totally see how much these people's lives are changed, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, most of them are like crying whenever they can hear their oh, loved yeah. ones versus Instantly. voices for the first time. It's crazy. Instantly. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know, man. It, it's you can kind of see like it's it increases your ability to connect with loved ones, obviously, again, which is yeah. going to make you feel more connected and just keep you stimulated throughout the day. And mm -hmm. like, once again, hopefully reduce your likelihood of developing dementia. So yeah, his vid videos are very like whimsical and like goofy and they're very like TikTokified mm -hmm. almost. They have that like yep. very, that style to him. And he's almost trying to be like the Oprah of YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then his style, like still, I mean, it makes sense whenever he's doing some goofy game for like a million yeah. dollar prize. But whenever he's like bringing people's hearing back, it's like, man, I, I think he needs to like change his style just a touch yeah, that's to like capture that mood. Yeah. Instead of like, it seems like the mood towards what they're doing is just slightly off. And I think that's more of why people got upset. Yeah, I could see that too. I could see that too. I will say one thing that he did, which was admirable, is that he didn't monetize the video, right? So like that, I didn't that helps that. a little. Yeah, yeah, it helps a little bit, I guess, from, from some people's perspectives. But yeah, man, I think the video was like six minutes long and he did it for a thousand people. So it's like, yeah, yeah. he probably could have made that like a, a mini documentary. It would have gotten just as many views and probably Seriously. had a better feel to it, I would imagine. Yeah. 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 That is amazing that he did that all in six minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 he, you're right. You could do like a Netflix series on that, you know? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would do, I, I would imagine it would do pretty close to just as well. But at the same time, I mean, yeah. the guy has probably got the YouTube algorithm down pretty good now. So, I mean, yeah, I think he knows what he's doing. Yeah, he probably understands the right length of video. So, uh, but yeah, I think you're right. In terms of some of the backlash, if he made that a longer form video, it probably would have maybe been received better by some folks at least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, 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 uh, he like had like the funny, uh, like on off switch things. I know people were upset about that, but mm -hmm. he, I don't, he, he's awesome. You know, he's helping people out. Yeah. And he's get, he's given like a lot of money to people. And not only that, he's paying for things that are just total gaps in our health insurance and our health care in our country. Yeah. Yeah, man, no doubt. I think one of the things we talked about briefly was kind of before this, we were sending each other articles and stuff back and forth. But mm -hmm. it was interesting to see Elon Musk's response, right? He always gets into he always jumps into it in Twitter. He always jumps yeah. into it on Twitter, rather. And yeah. uh, faces plenty of backlash himself. But it was interesting because he basically said, like, hey, I'm always looking for ways to donate money and just kind of donate to causes that are actually effective at the end of the day. Because, I mean, you see all these charities yeah. and things, and it's like 90% of the money donated is basically to compensate the people who work at the charity, right? Yeah. So he kind of was looking for more of like a grassroots opportunity to donate something. So it was interesting to see that, you know, he might jump in. I mean, who knows? It might just be he's just talking back on the Internet. But yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I just love that Mr. Beast is trying to give away all his money. I didn't yeah. realize he didn't monetize it. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to do like 100 million views and he's it's oh, not yeah. monetized. Oh, easily. Yeah, that's crazy. It's fascinating, man. No yeah. doubt. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's got he's got all his other business stuff, too. So I yeah. think he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, man, I hear you. Yeah. But, yeah. I don't know if you want to want to switch kind of change course here for a second and kind of jump into Elon some more. Talk, but talk about Elon. You want to do it? Yeah, as long as you're going to tell me that the Cybertruck's ready to go. And we, we got one on the way. <laughs> Did you put it in order for one yet or no? <laughs> yeah. no I, didn't know, I didn't know you could do that past the $100 uh, thing the $100 he did a few deposit. years ago. Did you put one down? Did you put one down? No, no, no. no. <laughs> All right, shoot. Um, yeah, man, it's interesting because, you know, Elon was talking about, like, the hearing aids with Mr. Beast, and obviously that made me think about his Neuralink and his Neuralink. Mm -hmm endeavor that he's kind mm -hmm. of talked about in the past i don't know how familiar people are with Neuralink in general um i guess for anyone it like, who, yeah go ahead, it, go like, ahead. it like it like it made some news maybe what five or six years ago yeah i feel like it really really took off a couple of years ago and then it's been pretty yeah. quiet since i know there's been some controversy with some animal rights stuff recently i mean who mm -hmm. who knows if it's if it's valid or not if there's legitimacy to the, some of the things that are being said I mean, I think Elon would tell you that it's all BS, but yeah, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I sent you a, the most recent kind of press release they've had is kind of a video. It was a demonstration from about five months ago, right? And I guess mm -hmm. for anyone who's unaware, kind of what Neuralink is, once again, it's Elon Musk's new company that's basically um, going to place a small quarter sized it's called a neural chip, I guess, in your skull. It's, it literally looks like a coin, but it's maybe like 
10 quarters stacked on top of each other, right? Yeah. And the chip basically has thousands of kind of tiny wires that are implanted on the surface of your brain tissue. And they do this with the robotic surgeons. They actually cut a hole in your skull and then implant this chip on the surface of your brain. Um, and basically the device can help with a ton of different things. So one of the things that Elon cites a lot is um, curing certain forms of blindness. So people who maybe were even born blind, for example, can now be given mm -hmm. the ability to see. And once again, these are things that haven't been necessarily proven yet, but he's very hopeful that this can actually take place. Um, it can also allow someone who's paralyzed to kind of interact with the world in ways that are not currently possible. So you could be quadriplegic and maybe you're nonverbal and you don't have an ability to communicate and you feel like you're trapped in your own body. This is going to give people mm -hmm. in a, a, a real, real, um, you know, new capability that they've never had before. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. So like I said, the device can help with all those sorts of things, but the video that I sent you from five months ago, I think the most notable clips that I sent were, there was a video of a monkey that was actually controlling a mouse and keyboard using just his brain. Now, yeah. I guess the engineers were basically telling him what words to spell. It's not like the monkey was out here like communicating in English, but it was yeah. <laughs> really moving the mouse to the keyboard and typing out words at a very, very quick rate. And I guess the hope is that this can actually be done quicker than we can currently type with our fingers. So it's uh -huh. an instantaneous way to perform communication, I guess. Um, so that's super interesting there. And the other thing I'm going to mention too, and we're just going to do open forum here. But there was also a video of a pig where the device was implanted. Actually, instead of on the brain, the device was implanted on his spinal cord. And mm -hmm. I believe, you know, they were actually able to flex and straighten the pig's rear leg in a variety of different a variety of different ways. And they were able to actually mm -hmm. hold that flex for a long time and then bring it back in. And it's like if you could repeat that pattern, it's like obviously your brain starts to go to a million different places. Like, you know, there's a ton of possibilities in terms of restoring someone's movement potentially who does mm -hmm. not have that brain to spinal cord connection anymore if it's been severed in an accident things like that so i don't mm -hmm. know those two things for sure were the most notable to me the other piece was like a, the robot actually performing the implantation of the device but you mm -hmm. know i would just love to get your thoughts kind of as someone who works in rehabilitative medicine kind mm -hmm. of what kind of possibilities does this open up yeah this is just right up my alley mm -hmm. um i first off of the the first people i thought about well I saw the video of the monkey and I was like, wow, this monkey can speak English. <laughs> I know, I know. And then I realized that I think they were using like yellow targets yes. for him to like go uh, the monkey to go click the, the things. Yeah. But it was, it, that was pretty amazing. And then uh, my, my first thought though was to a spinal cord injury mm -hmm. because we understand, we don't understand cognition that well but we understand movement and like how our body moves really well. And so as much as we don't understand cognition, we really understand how the spinal cord works, what the tracks are in the spinal cord and how like the motor movements of our body work. So we can, I, I am like really certain that they could eventually do this in the relatively near future with an implant on somebody's brain because they know where the motor areas are the brain that communicates to a, a device in the spinal cord that then stimulates people's spinal cord to actually make their muscles move. And that, to me, that's pretty wild. I, I think this could also be applicable to people who have had strokes, to people that have ALS, to people that have Parkinson's disease, to people that have cerebral palsy, and also to people that have amputations. So I think there is a huge population that this is uh, eventually going to help. Now, how soon that is, I have no idea. But when you yeah. see when you see monkeys using it, you're like, all right, how far off are we? You know, mm -hmm. um, and then there's, of course, people are going to say, well, oh, yeah, you go implant a chip in your brain. I'm like, people would 100 percent use this. Yeah. Oh, people, exactly. people already implant all sorts of things in their body. You know, people in implant cardiovascular devices to make sure that their heart, if it goes into arrhythmia, gets shocked back into a normal rhythm. You know, we have uh, pain pumps that we put in people's back, spinal cord stimulators that we deal with pain by implanting into bodies. I don't think this is, uh, I, I don't know, what do you think? You think people, people would be willing to use this, especially if they're in the situation of like a spinal cord injury? Yeah, I mean, I think that the masses aren't going to, aren't going to like, swell this to basically be able to type faster on their keyboards but i think yes. that you know but the crazy thing is there's a 
a large subset of people that probably would do that. You yeah, know that's I mean? true. <laughs> the people yeah. who live out in the Silicon Valleys of the world who want to become, you know, uh, I guess more proficient in the way they work so, or efficient in the way they work, I could totally see them wanting to adopt this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that especially someone who's in a situation of desperation who really, obviously, like I said, like imagine, imagine someone who's quadriplegic, who is nonverbal. Mm-hmm and who has thoughts, but is not able to yeah. express them in any way to the outside world. It's like, of course, they're going to adopt this. And I think yeah. one, once the masses see someone like that, whose life is completely changed, and they see the capabilities of the device, I think once the desperate folks are able to show how incredible the device is, then mm-hmm. other people who are, you know, just members of society who want to just become more efficient, are potentially going to want to adopt this device as well. So yeah. I don't know, man, it's really, really fascinating to think that uh, this might not be that far off. And one yeah. thing I do want to mention too, I was really unaware of this whole field, I guess, prior to this. The, the big thing about Neuralink isn't that Neuralink is like doing these things for the first time. Apparently they've had monkeys be able to play Pong in the past with just their brain um, yeah. and do things like type on a keyboard. All these things have been done, even dating as far back to the 90s. But what's so yeah. interesting about Neuralink is that they're able to do this with a small device that's rechargeable that mm-hmm. is wireless that utilizes Bluetooth function, right? So the previous devices, they basically required you to be in a lab that was connected to um, wires, and then those wires mm-hmm. were then connected to you, and then those wires would be connected to another device. So think of yourself basically attached to a ton of extension cords. Like that's not Yeah, plugged plausible. into extension cords. Yeah. yeah. It's like that's not plausible for you to go out and live your normal life. What's so interesting is this device is so small and so discreet uh-huh. and can basically do all the same things that have been done over the past 25, 30 years with this research, mm-hmm. but in a mobile way. So I think those are where the biggest breakthroughs are coming. And then I think obviously the team of engineers they're gonna have is going to be an, an, I would imagine a very, very impressive impressive yeah. team going to expand on this research and come up with a ton of different, you know, uses for this device. But, um, yeah, yeah, man, it's, well, the other thing too, is that there are going to be pieces of this device that are used for things that are totally outside mm-hmm. what they're intending to use it for. So like they made that specific camera to implant the device, which I thought was really cool. It basically took three different devices, which one was like a light to shine in. Uh, the other one was, some sort of implant implantation thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one to sense like where blood vessels were. I believe that's like three of them. And they made a brand new device and they said they were using photon magic to create some sort of new device. And that could be used for a variety of things. The other thing that they developed was the, the brain doesn't just sit still as blood's pumped into it. And as we breathe, it actually moves. Mm -hmm. And so they have to be able to implant this device make sure they don't hit any blood vessels and cause a stroke. So they, Im- the device is implanted and they have to make sure to miss the blood vessels. Mm-hmm. And that technology yeah. is there. So I'm like, that has all sorts of other applications as well. Yeah. You know, now that you say that too, I want to mention one other thing too. So I guess the wires that are actually attached to the device previously, mm-hmm. I want to say that the most wires have been able to, ever, like, been able to attach to the brain simultaneously is around 200. These mm-hmm. wires are so small that they have closer to 2,000 different wires that can connect to the brain with this small device. Yeah. So once again, you have 10x the connection, 10x the capabilities in some regards. So um, yeah. I, I listened to another video from another neuroscientist who was really excited about the technology. And those were the reasons he cited the, the fact that it's mobile and the fact that it had essentially more connections to the brain and I guess mm-hmm. more variability in, in terms of what it can control. So. Yeah, yeah, man. yeah. It, it's going to be able to restore people's, uh, potentially restore people's vision, mm-hmm. their mobility, their ability to just interact with things. Even if it, even if it can just get people to interact with things, I mean that's yeah. huge. That's that people people with like you described before with locked in syndrome, where mm-hmm. they can they can only move their eyes up and down and blink. Yeah. You know that that's right. it. And now all of a sudden they could interact with a computer. Mm-hmm. Type type stuff out, have communication. I mean, that's that's yeah. pretty impressive. And then the fact that it's all like contained too is is really cool as well. Yeah, yeah, man. yeah. So I think there's plenty of applications for it. The other things too is like there's there's probably ways that they can use this technology for um, devices that help people like control their bowel and bladder, like simple mm-hmm. things that you don't think of that are hugely impactful to people and very inconvenient. Oh, obviously. Um, yeah. that, 
that they could fix. I do wonder if they can use this to uh, implant it in the area of the brain that causes Parkinson's and be able to just like fix Parkinson's. That would be incredible. Yeah. Yeah, man. I know so I know when Elon's talked about it in the past, I think, like you mentioned, I think he kind of has been pushing this for the last couple of years now. Mm-hmm. But I know he initially talked about it. I remember he, like basically the possibilities are endless from what the way that he makes it sound. Now who's who yeah. that's true. I'm sure there's I'm not a neuroscientist. I know that there's different areas of the brain, obviously. And if you're only talking about the mm-hmm. surface of your brain, there's probably a limit to what you can control on the surface of your brain with wires as opposed to deeper in your brain. So Yeah. Yeah, well, they can get in there deep. I mean, they they, yeah. they implant devices in deep in the brainstem and stuff. So who knows? Who knows? Yeah. It's also like the, like, for example, I always think about when the iPad came out. When the iPad came out, they had no idea that they were going to put that in restaurants and at airports and stuff like that to be used <laughs> to, like, put orders in. So yeah. who knows what this will be used for? Yeah, man, no doubt. I'm, like, just thinking if somebody out there is just doing psilocybin, with a brain implant and watching Mr. Beast videos, they're probably doing all right. Oh my God. They're loving it. They're absolutely loving yeah. it now. Yeah. No doubt. So, you know, if you, if you enjoyed the podcast uh, and you're watching on YouTube, please click subscribe below. If you're on uh, Spotify or Apple podcasts, click the subscribe button. Otherwise this is the prescription press. I'm Nolan Fisher. This is Sam sticks. We'll see you next time. Peace.